Section 8.2, Photosynthesis and Overview. So basically what we are going to be introduced here is that the key cellular process identified with energy production is photosynthesis. And basically what we see is that photosynthesis is the process in which green plants use the energy of sunlight to convert water, which is H2O, and carbon dioxide, CO2, into high energy carbohydrates and oxygen gas. So, key concept from this section. What did the experiments of Van Helmont, Priestley, and Igenhaus reveal about how plants grow? By the end of this section, we should be able to answer this question. So, in investigating photosynthesis, Research into photosynthesis began centuries ago. In the 1600s, Jan van Helmont wanted to find out if plants grew by taking material out of the soil. What he did is he determined the mass of a pot of dry soil and a small seedling. He planted the seedling in the pot and watered it regular, regularly after about five years, the seedling was a small tree and then gained 75 kilograms of mass, but the soil's mass was almost unchanged. So in taking things in his investigation, Helmont wanted to find out if plants grew by taking material out of the soil. So over this five year period, the seedling grew and gained 75 kilograms but the soil's mass was almost unchanged. Where do you think that gain in mass might have come from? Van Helmont concluded that the gain in mass came from water because water was the only thing he added to the system. Hence, the soil remained relatively unchanged the plant gained 75 kilograms of mass, but the only thing added to the soil over that duration of five years was water. His experiment accounted for the hydrate or the water portion of carbohydrates. Remember in biochemistry, when we broke that word down, carbohydrate, it meant carbon and water. And we know that the portion of the carbohydrate is produced by photosynthesis. So if we know where the hydrate for a carbohydrate comes from, where does the carbon from carbohydrate come from? Although Van Helmont did not realize it, carbon dioxide in the air is a major contr contributor to the mass of his tree. In photosynthesis, the carbon in each carbon dioxide is used to make sugars and other carbohydrates. So if you could picture this now, thinking about it, since we studied sugars, if carbon dioxide is CO2, one carbon per carbon dioxide molecule, how many carbon dioxide molecules would be needed to produce a sugar like glucose? Think of the molecular formula for sh sh glucose, that carbohydrate. How many CO2 molecules are needed? Van Helmont had only part of the story, but he had a major contribution to science. More than 100 years after Van Helmont's experiment, a guy by the name of Joe Priestley provided another insight into the process of photosynthesis. This is what we refer to as Priestley's experiment. Priestley took a candle, placed a jar over it, and watched the flame gradually die out. We have probably all done that in our chemistry kits uh, when we were kids, if you had a chemistry kit, or you may have seen this done before. You take a, a, uh, a jar, with a candle, put, put the jar over it, the candle goes out. Well, why did the candle go out? Um, another an example is if you have a plate, put the, uh, adhere the, the candle to the plate, put a little water around the candle. If you put the jar over the candle, the candle goes out, 
the jar will fill up with the water. So why did that candle go out? He reasoned that the flame needed some, something in the air to keep burning. When it was used up, the flame went out. Of course, we know today that that substance was oxygen because we know in order to have fire, we must have oxygen gas. Priestley then placed a live sprig of mint, and basically that just means a piece of mint, under the jar and allowed it there to stay there for a few days. He found that the candle could be relighted and would remain lighted for a while. It definitely stayed, stayed lit longer than it had without the piece of mint. What happened? What we see is that the mint plant had produced the substance required for burning. In other words, it had released oxygen gas. To further Priestley's experiment, Jan Igenhaus showed that the effect observed by Priestley occurred only when the plant was exposed to light. The results of both Priestley and Igenhaus's experiment showed that light is necessary for plants to produce oxygen. Key concept. The experiments performed by Van Helmont, Priestley, Igenhaus led to work by other scientists who finally discovered that in the presence of light, plants transform carbon dioxide, CO2, and water, H2O, into carbohydrates. And they also release oxygen gas, O2. For our purpose, carbohydrate will represent glucose. Molecular formula, C6H12O6. So we see this in the overall equation for photosynthesis. So this is the key concept as well. The photosynthesis equation is 6CO2. So remember, previously in this lecture, I asked you how many carbon dioxide molecules are needed. You need six CO2 molecules to produce the six carbons found in the carbohydrate in this case, the carbohydrate would be right here, that's glucose, with its molecular formula C6H12O6. So you need six CO2 molecules plus six H2O molecules to produce C6H12O6, a sugar, and a byproduct of oxygen gas. And we have six molecules of oxygen gas. So carbon dioxide plus water plus light yields sugar and oxygen. So, as we come to the end, photosynthesis uses the energy of sunlight to convert water and carbon dioxide into high energy sugars and oxygen gas. So, light energy is coming in. Water is coming in. Now we have a reaction. This reaction is the light dependent reaction. The light dependent reaction essentially means that light is required in order for this reaction to take place. The reaction itself occurs in the chloroplast in little compartments that are called thylakoids. Out of this process, we generate oxygen gas. Also out of the light dependent reaction, we get two molecules. One of them is called ATP. You know what ATP is already. It stands for adenosine triphosphate. It's the energy molecule of our cells. The other molecule is called NADPH. NADPH is an electron carrier molecule. I'll explain this a little bit more in class. ATP and NADPH are going to be used in the second reaction of photosynthesis. Take note that oxygen gas is not used. It is a byproduct from, from photosynthesis and it is released back into the atmosphere. And when the oxygen gas is being released, the plant is also taking in carbon dioxide gas. Carbon dioxide is a requirement for making the sugar. So in the second reaction, we have CO2 coming in. In the first reaction, we have the water coming in. Together, these will make our carbohydrate. We also have water coming in here as well 
for the second part of the reaction. The second reaction, known as the Calvin cycle, occurs in an area of the chloroplast called the stroma. The stroma's reaction, or the Calvin cycle, is going to produce our sugar. And from that, we are going to regenerate ADP and NADP+. You know already that ADP is the alternate form of ATP. ATP is energy rich, ADP is energy poor. NADPH is electron rich, NADP plus is electron poor. They are going to feed back into this reaction. So, what is the role of light and a pigment called chlorophyll in photosynthesis? Light and pigments. How do plants capture the energy of the sun? In addition to water and carbon dioxide, photosynthesis does require that light. And light energy is captured via pigments. A pigment itself is a light absorbing molecule. Now, the main pigment in plants is a molecule called chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is green, hence its name, chloro meaning green. There are two main types of chlorophyll. For our sake, we are just going to learn two. There are actually four types of chlorophyll, but the two main types that you need to be aware of are chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. If you look here on the electra of the uh, visible spectrum, chlorophyll absorbs light well in the blue, violet, and red regions of this visible spectrum. So we know light energy has the colors Roy G. Biv red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. So remember those as Roy G. Biv. So we have uh, 400 nanometers in wavelength of light energy to 750 nanometers of wavelength of light energy. We could see that the estimated absorption is the percentage on the side, right here on the y-axis. So we see chlorophyll A absorbs a lot in the blue, violet, and the red, orange very little in the, the, the spectrum where green light is. Chlorophyll B, very good at absorbing red, blue light and violet light, absorbs a little bit of orangish reddish colors, a very poor at absorbing green light. What does this mean for photosynthesis? Chlorophyll that does not absorb light will, chlorophyll does not absorb light will in the green region of the spectrum so it doesn't absorb light well in the green region of the spectrum. Green light is considered to be reflected by leaves. So we say green light is reflected or transmitted through the plant, which is why plants look green. Light is a form of energy. So any compound that absorbs light also absorbs energy from that light. When chlorophyll absorbs light, much of the energy is transferred directly to electrons in the chlorophyll molecule, and it's going to excite those electrons, essentially raising the energy level of those electrons. The high energy electrons are what make photosynthesis work. So that is going to drive this reaction, especially the light dependent reaction. That will be our whole focus as we continue forward. So we will break down some of these concepts in this lecture in class, discuss them, give you a practice on this, uh, these concepts, and we'll continue on with the chapter. So we'll also see this a little bit with the lab activity that I have scheduled for us as well. All right, biology students, that's it for today. I hope you uh, learned from this lecture. Um, I hope you not only listened, but also copied notes into your notebook. Thank you very much, and have a nice day.